Hello, this is episode 237, and today we're chatting about why we could consider a carnivore diet, a bit about plants and toxins, why we've been led astray with regard to meat, like it causing cancer, CVD, all of those things, and the environmental considerations and regenerative agriculture concerns with a carnivore-ish diet. Now, if you have questions about today's content, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and ask me. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes and notes from today's show by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Now, just scroll down on that page, look for episode 237, and that's where you're going to find all the links and resources for today's show. If we speak about anything, it'll be there. Okay, a little announcement for the podcast uh, just before we get started. This is the last Wednesday episode of the Keto Diet Podcast for a while. I have mixed feelings about this. I was really upset to have to cut down to one episode a week. I really do enjoy creating these episodes for you, but we've kind of gotten to a place financially with the podcast where we weren't getting as many sponsors as we were hoping. And this... It sucks because there are a lot of keto brands out there that are willing to support the show, but a lot of them are garbage and a lot of them use really garbagey ingredients. And as keto gains popularity, sadly, a lot of the ingredients and companies are being bought by other companies and then those ingredients are garbage. Their message is garbage and I'm just not okay with promoting that. So it's been a challenge because it's so very easy to just say yes to the money and yes to the ads so I could say yes to continuing. But I have pretty high standards as you've come to know on the Keto Diet Podcast. And although if I would have said yes to a couple of brands that I personally would never eat and never promote ever, (laughs) it would mean the continuation of the podcast, but it just didn't feel authentic and right for me. So we're switching down to just Sunday episodes. They are not going away. I am very happy happy to report that we have some amazing sponsors that have committed through to the end of the year supporting the show and the show continues to grow. So that's so exciting that there are a handful of brands that are high quality, great humans running these brands and are supporting our Sunday episodes. So when I learned about this, I was really upset. We tried to make it work, but I don't think a lot of people really understand what goes into a podcast. And I sure didn't when I got started in the podcasting world all those years ago, thinking like, how hard can it be? I just sit in front of a microphone and then post it live. Well, before you post it, you need to edit it. And before you edit it, you need to find music for it. And you have to pay for the music. You have to pay for the editing. You have to pay for the hosting to put the the podcast on and pay for all the little graphics that you have on each of the images and each of the episodes. So it really does add up. And without those sponsors, it becomes very challenging. Now, I have have another podcast called Love Rebel and it is also a free ad free rather zone so you know with all the ad free stuff it just gets a little bit challenging to balance so Just a little note that Wednesday episodes are being quote unquote canceled for now. But if you have some sponsor recommendations and you can think of wicked brands that I haven't promoted yet that you think would be a great fit for the show, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact and let me know. And I'd love to reach out to them to see if we could bring back Wednesday episodes. But for now, we're going to slide back to just Sundays. And I promise you, I have some really good stuff coming out. So I hope you will enjoy it. Okay. Our guest today is Dr. Salandino. He is the leading authority on the science and application of the carnivore diet. He has used this diet to reverse autoimmunity, chronic inflammation, and mental health issues in hundreds of patients, many of whom have been told that their conditions were untreatable. In addition to his personal podcast, Fundamental Health, he can be found featured on numerous podcasts, including The Minimalist, The Model Health Show, Bulletproof Radio, The Dr. Gundry Podcast. The Ben Greenfield podcast, Dr. Mercola, Health Theory, Mark Bell's Power Project, and so many others. What an epic list, right? He also appeared on the Doctor's TV show and is the author of The Carnivore Code, Unlocking the Secrets to Optimal Health by Returning to Your Ancestral Diet. When he is not researching connections between nutritional biochemistry and chronic disease, he can be found in the ocean searching for the perfect wave, cultivating mindfulness, or spending time with friends friends and family. I feel like if Paul and I were to meet in real life, we would totally get along sitting in the ocean waiting for the perfect wave. 
Now, his book came out February 25th. You can find out more details by going to thecarnivorecodebook.com. And his website is carnivoremd.com. Again, his podcast is Fundamental Health. And you can find him on social as Carney B. Vor MD. So that's C A R N I B V O R E M D. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21 page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working. Did you know imbalanced hormones are generally at the core of all struggles that women face when it comes to our weight? Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. Thanks so much for listening and let's get started with the show. Well, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. I guess that's probably Leanne's line, but uh, she's invited me on this week and I'm glad to be here. My name is Dr. Paul Saladino. I've got my own podcast, which is Fundamental Health. And so I'm used to talking a lot, but not used to doing a long monologue. So we'll see how this one goes. I also recently wrote a book called The Carnivore Code, which will give away the punchline of this podcast as the carnivore diet, which when a lot of people hear about this, they think that is crazy. How could you only eat meat? How could you shun plants? We're going to talk all about it. And believe me, there are softer versions of the carnivore diet. There are softer, kinder, gentler versions of a carnivore diet that might be called carnivore-ish, etc. But just to start out, I want to tell you guys a little bit about my story, how I got interested in this, my background. But I also think that if we're going to do something like a carnivore diet that is going to step so ra radically outside of the norm, there has to be some reason to do it. And so if you guys are familiar with the carnivore diet, you may have heard of the hundreds or at this point, thousands of people who have found improvements in autoimmune disease eating this way. But if you aren't, I would encourage you to check out what people are experiencing on a carnivore diet. It's certainly not a panacea, but as we'll talk about a little bit in this podcast today, it's a very, very powerful intervention, I believe, because it emphasizes foods which are very healthy for humans, specifically animal foods. And in this podcast, we're going to get into why animal foods have been wrongly vilified and how meat is not necessarily bad for you in any way, shape, or form, though some of the messaging we get is that it might be. And the flip side of the equation is that plants uh, do contain toxins. Most people who have gardened or have been in the wilderness will know that plants have toxins. It's just, I think with the carnivore diet, what we're trying to understand is how toxic some plants are, which plants are the most toxic, and which plants might be triggering autoimmune illness in us. So those will be the themes that we'll be talking about today. And I think about it as a spectrum. I think that the two premises of a carnivore diet are those that I mentioned, that animal foods are the best foods on the planet. They're the most nutritious. They're the most bioavailable nutrients. We'll talk about that. That plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity. I definitely don't think everyone needs to cut out all the plants from their diet. I think that uh, perhaps like ketosis or low carbohydrate diets, we might consider cycling this way. If we think about the evolution of our ancestors, uh, especially in more northern climates, they almost certainly had periods of the year where they were not eating many carbohydrates or many plants uh, because they wouldn't grow in the seasons. So I think that it's interesting to think about maybe cycling plants in and out, or at least understanding which plants we are eating that might be triggering reactions, autoimmunity, inflammation, hormonal imbalances in us and trying to eliminate those as best as possible. So eating, if we're going to eat plants, which plants are the least toxic, which plants are the most toxic, and then where does our nutrition really come from in animal foods? So that stuff is super, super interesting to me, and I'm excited to share it all with you guys today. So my story. So I currently live in San Diego, love to surf, been a mountain guy my whole life, but when I got out of college, I was pretty burned out. Didn't want to go to medical school, spent six years being a ski bum, traveled all around the world skiing, hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. Eventually, I went back to physician assistant school. So I was a PA in cardiology for four years. What I quickly realized doing that was that I wasn't satisfied with the mainstream medical model. And I really struggled to get excited about prescribing medications to ameliorate symptoms without addressing the root cause of an illness, right? That sounds reasonable. So that became my obsession. What is causing disease? What is causing illness? And I got interested in what you might call a unifying theory of illness. 
And isn't there something that's probably causing a lot of illness? What are the commonalities in what we see? At that time, even before I went to medical school and got my MD, I was interested in autoimmune disease and inflammation. But as I said, I wasn't really happy as a PA because I didn't feel like I had enough autonomy to advance the paradigm to really help people understand what might be at the root of their illness or ask those questions or you know, even go outside of the norm, which was basically, you should give this person an antihypertensive, you should give this person a statin, you should give this person this drug for this. I was interested in diet and food and how those might be causing atherosclerosis, the plaque formation in the arteries, hypertension, all these other issues. That was what fascinated me. What is this food lever? How can that affect things? Kind of had this suspicion, which many of us probably share, that that food is a great lever. It's a huge lever that a lot of the chronic disease that we see today is related to food and discordance or incongruities, incompatibilities between the food that we are eating today and our genetics, our ancestral blueprint. And that brings us to interesting questions around what is a species appropriate diet for humans, which we'll kind of be talking about today as well. So I got, you know, a little bit uncomfortable as a PA. And I decided, all right, I got to go back to medical school. So I went back to medical school after four years as a physician assistant in medical school, did residency at the University of Washington. And all through that time had my own autoimmune issues. So I had some pretty severe eczema, which uh, was not kind to me very often. Uh, I had severe flares on my elbows, knees, wrists, uh, lower back, and it was pretty bad. It was pretty darn bad. I mean, I had, at times, I, it got super infected. I was doing a lot of martial arts, a lot of jujitsu, and I had to take antibiotics, topical steroids, even once go to the hospital for IV antibiotics when things got really bad. So um, my eczema was really bad. And this was despite eating what I thought was a very good species-appropriate diet. I was eating a fully organic paleo diet, which was low-carb very often, and still my eczema flared frequently. And so it was quite interesting for me to, to think, what am I missing? What is wrong with what I am doing such that my eczema is continuing? If my illness is not fixed with an organic paleo diet, what am I possibly missing? And that was all through medical school, into residency, and pretty much throughout residency until the last couple of years. What I realized was that there probably were still foods in my diet that were triggering my immune system. Eczema is autoimmune, and um, as are so many of the conditions that many of us struggle with, whether it's Hashimoto's thyroiditis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, um, even osteoarthritis probably has some autoimmune mechanisms. Uh, the, the list goes on, Sjogren's, scleroderma, on and on and on. Even psychiatric disease, uh, I believe, has roots in autoimmunity and systemic inflammation. So I was asking myself, what are the food triggers here that are causing the problem? So I tried to understand what my food triggers were and which foods were actually triggering this autoimmune disease for me because it persisted, as I talked about. And as I kind of dug into this research, I found autoimmune paleo and I thought, okay, maybe I'll cut out seeds and nuts. Those could be triggering my autoimmune stuff. And then you find out about nightshades, which are things like tomato, white potato, eggplant, goji berries, egg, uh, all that kind of stuff, the Solanaceae family. And then I found out about things like oxalates and high oxalate foods include beets and rhubarb and turmeric is a high oxalate food. Uh, along with um, spinach is a very high oxalate food. And I've been eating a lot of that in the past. Okay. And then eventually I realized that there were a lot of toxins in plants and they could all be triggering me. There's high histamine foods, both in the animal and the plant kingdom and just tons of stuff everywhere. And so I sequentially started cutting out foods and my paleo diet got simpler and simpler and simpler until it was basically romaine lettuce and avocado uh, in a salad with maybe some olive oil and a lot of grass-fed meat. And my eczema continued. And so at that point, I realized, okay, what is going on here? How can I still be getting eczema? What is triggering this? I still thought it was food. I was trying to do everything else I could that could possibly be triggering. It, and I determined that it was probably food. So at that point, I heard about the carnivore diet. And like many of you listening to this, or if you've heard of the carnivore diet, or if this is the first time you've heard of it, it sounded crazy to me. It sounded crazy. How could we give up plants? Didn't we need fiber? Didn't we need all these magical compounds in plants, polyphenols, et cetera? Aren't there phytonutrients in plants that are valuable? How could we only eat meat? And the first thing I did was kind of think about it. And then I realized that what I'd been doing for the last number of months on my paleo diet was sequentially cutting out plant toxins. And so 
I dug into the research uh, of plant toxins and realized they were many and that the conceptualization that we have generally of plant compounds is a little bit incomplete. And there are some alternative stories there that we'll talk about. And there's a lot of interesting science that suggests we may not have the complete story there either in terms of necessity or benefit. And that many of us have not been just talked about, or many people have not been informed about the potential way that plant toxins can harm them. And so I started a carnivore diet uh, probably about a year and three quarters ago at this point. And wouldn't you know it, within two to three weeks, my eczema was completely gone. And I had a bunch of other benefits that were quite surprising to me. I had uh, improvement in my mood and things just looked better in life. I was a little more positive. I had mental clarity. It was just things were much easier to get through. The meter determining how likely I was to honk at somebody in traffic went way down. I was just a much happier person. I thought, whoa, there is something to this. I need to dig into it. And that is history. And since then, I've been fascinated by a carnivore diet. And I just wrote a book about it. And I have a podcast where I don't talk exclusively about the carnivore diet, but I talk about diets and um, been on a lot of other podcasts talking about it, done a ton of research about it. So anyway, that's what got me interested in the carnivore diet. I've worked with many, many clients now on ketogenic diets, carnivore diets, carnivore-ish diets, and some folks who just eat paleo or low carb or uh, moderate carb. And, and learned a lot about what works and what doesn't. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. Today's show is brought to you by Four Sigmatic, the makers of my favorite magic elixirs, like the Lion's Mane Elixir. Add to coffee, your morning tea, smoothies, shakes, you name it, and watch your anxiety go down and your cognitive function increase. Each of their elixirs are formulated to support various aspects of your health and wellness, from brain function to energy production, relaxation, and more. They're easy to travel with, you can add them to any liquid, and they're pretty tasty too. Use the coupon code KETO, all in caps, for 15% off all things at foursigmatic.com slash keto. Unsure of the link? Check out today's show notes for all the details. So if we move on from my story to kind of my overall perspective with regard to medicine and disease, I think that my experience is both as a physician now and in my training, in my clinical practice, and my personal experiences really reinforced the idea for me that food is the biggest lever in health and disease. And I think that is the first thing. I've really come to the conclusion that no matter what dietary choice we make, an intentional dietary choice is a step in the right direction. And so I will congratulate and appreciate anyone who makes an intentional dietary choice. I think that perhaps the worst thing we can do is just keep doing things that haven't worked for us, stay limited by our conditioning, stay limited by societal norms, stay limiting by things, stay limited by things we've been told without examining them. So if, if someone does a plant-based diet or a vegan diet and finds improvement in their health, who am I to tell them that's not a good thing? If they were working with me as a client, I would want to make sure they had full nutrient adequacy, which is one of my concerns on a vegan diet. And I probably won't get too much into that, but I've spoken about it many times before on my podcast and in my book. But ultimately, I think that what I hope the next step is for Western medicine is understanding that food affects autoimmune disease and that food is a huge trigger. And that when we have autoimmune and inflammatory chronic illness, we really need to take a look at foods we are eating and try and understand which of those could be causing problems for us. If we are currently eating a diet that we feel good about, that makes us feel good, and we are kicking tons of butt in our life, then why change anything, no matter what you're doing? Like, don't change anything, just keep crushing it. Um, but there are a lot of people, and this is what I've realized in my training, who think they're doing the right things, who are trying to eat healthy and remain sick. And a lot of people go to their doctors and they're not even told to think about food. So those are the two main problems I have with this, or the two main sort of areas in which I think a carnivore diet or thinking more specifically about spectrums of plant toxicity and where we're actually getting our nutrients can be helpful. The first one is um, that we are not thriving, that we have an autoimmune illness, that we have a chronic illness, that we have hormonal imbalance due to a variety of causes, perhaps insulin resistance or otherwise, and that, that we've tried other things that haven't worked. So what's left? Well, it's useful to think about 
carnivore as an option, carnivore-ish as an option from the perspective of plant toxicity and how we can get lots of good nutrients in the animals. And again, that doesn't mean cutting out all plants. It might just mean cutting out the ones that might be triggering us and we can think about which ones might be most toxic. We'll talk about that later in this podcast. And then the other piece of that equation is just knowing that if we have an autoimmune disease, if we have an illness that is inflammatory and we go to our physician and they don't tell us that food is potentially at the root of this, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, all the other autoimmune diseases that I talked about earlier in this podcast, there, there's a piece missing from that equation. If you know people who have inflammatory autoimmune illness and they are not thinking about food as a trigger or as a leverage point, then there, there is hope for them or there is more modality they can leverage to get much better. Okay, so that's what's super interesting for me. Now, let's move on from that discussion to think about the place of plants and animals in the food chain and why we've been told that plants are good for us. And and let's talk about plants first, and then we'll talk about animals. So I want to start with plants, and then I will talk about animals. When we're talking about plants, we will discuss where plants lie in broad ecosystems and why there might be more toxins than we're aware of. When we're talking about animals, I will do my best to at least give you guys the beginnings of some some threads that you can pursue. Again, I've got the book coming out in which I expand on this all greatly. It'll be out February 25th. I've got many chapters in the book debunking all of the myths about why meat is not bad for us, right? We've been told this narrative about meat, so I want to get into that in the podcast too, but let's start with plants. So in the book, I offer this suggestion. Imagine yourself as a plant. What does a plant feel like? The scenario that I ask the reader of the book to envision is being buried up to your head in the sand at the beach like when you were a kid, except so tightly that you can't get out. You can't move. You're stuck in the sand. And then I paint your face like a soccer ball just because, you know, not because I don't like you, just because it's just, that's what we do in this scenario. We paint your face like a soccer ball. So your face is painted like a soccer ball. You're buried up to your neck in the sand. And suddenly a busload of irascible, hungry, irritable six-year-olds arrives from soccer practice to the beach. How are you going to feel? You're going to feel vulnerable because, you know, it, hopefully there are some chaperoning adults around to prevent those little six-year-olds from coming over and uh, kicking you in the face. That would be a bad thing. Well, the reason I, I suggest this analogy is that plants are rooted in the ground. Plants and animals have co-evolved on this planet for probably about 450 million years. And in order for plants to survive, they have evolved a number of defense mechanisms. Plants do want animals to eat their fruit, and we can talk about the fruit in a second, but plants generally do not want animals to eat their stems, leaves, roots, or seeds. If animals eat those parts of plants, the plants will die. Now, sometimes plants are willing to do it, or they can tolerate some consumption of stems or leaves, but overconsumption will kill the plant. And so almost invariably, plants have developed toxins. They've developed pesticides that are made by the plant. There are many articles that talk about this. There's a famous one from 1990 uh, by Bruce Ames titled Dietary Pesticides, 99.99% All Natural. I detail this paper in the book, but basically Bruce Ames is discussing the fact that there are hundreds, thousands of plant compounds that are not even fully characterized that are known to be plant defense chemicals or phytoalexins. These are compounds produced by plants to ward off insect and animal predation. Many of these have been tested in cell culture models or rodent models and found to either damage DNA, which means create breaks in the double strand of the DNA, or to induce tumors in rice, mice and rats at various doses. And they are readily a part of our food supply. We don't fully understand how they might affect humans, but there are also studies in human cell culture with many of these plant compounds that show that they can potentially damage our DNA as well. And so this really shouldn't come as a surprise. There are, we're aware of plant toxins. You know, when you grow up, if you had a poinsettia in the house around Christmas, you realize that plant is toxic. You do not want to eat that plant. You say, keep it away from the toddlers. And there are lots of these chemicals that we're much less aware of. Something like spinach, for instance, is so high in oxalate that it can definitely be linked to kidney stones and many other problems with oxalate deposition throughout our bodies as spinach has kind of used oxalate to dissuade animals from eating it over the course of its evolution. There are other chemicals that we may be familiar with, like resveratrol, which is actually a phytoelection. That's a plant defense chemical produced by grapes and peanuts and other berries to fend off a fungus called botrytis that can erode those fruits. Now, we may have heard of resveratrol and that it's amazingly good for us, but 
I did a whole podcast with David Sinclair and we kind of went toe to toe with him on this. If you actually look at the research with resveratrol, it's not really f- demonstrated itself to be that beneficial for humans. It's failed in trials of uh, metabolic syndrome. It failed in a prostate cancer trial. It failed in a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease trial. And what we know about resveratrol is that it can be a hormonal disruptor. Um, so this is a plant defense chemical that can bind to and activate the 17 beta estradiol receptor and cause hormonal uh, imbalance, causing kind of an estrogenic signal. And in the study with prostate cancer, resveratrol was actually shown to decrease androgen precursors, which is bad for men, but it suggests that it could be disrupting hormones in both men and women. Now, unless we're consuming tons of wine or a resveratrol concentrate, this probably won't be a problem for us. But a lot of people are pushing for resveratrol concentrates these days. And this is just meant to illustrate that these are plant defense chemicals. And that's what plants have had to use to maintain their survival. There are stories of giraffes and other animals that die after eating acacia uh, leaves if they're overgrazing or they're forced to graze in a small amount of land. Most grazing animals, most herbivores will not just eat one plant sort of ad infinitum. They will eat a little bit of a plant, a little bit of another one, a little bit of another one. And if they are enclosed in a fenced off area or forced to eat plants in excess, they often become sick or die. And there are examples of grazing animals that die in mass when their grazing lands are limited by human encroachment or even fencing in and distinct uh, limitation of where they can roam because they overgraze on specific plants. So ruminant animals or herbivorous animals sort of realize that if they're going to eat plants, they need to eat a little bit of one plant at a time. And they have this kind of evolutionary programming because of these plant toxins that are in these plants. So that's where plants stand with humans. We're familiar with the physical spikes, like roses have thorns, you go in the woods, there are many sort of stinging nettles, but these are chemical spikes that are built into plants. Now, the next thing people will say when we talk about this is, isn't this hormesis? Isn't this uh, the plant compounds being good for us by being a little bit of a poison? And what's interesting about that suggestion is that, number one, it acknowledges that these plant compounds are poisonous. Uh, Things like isothiocyanate, uh, which is a compound derived from the brassica plants, the brassica vegetables, including broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, etc. This one is often touted as a hormetic compound. Now, I don't want this to get too technical, but if we look at the way hormetic compounds work in the human body, generally they're, they're thought to be, quote, antioxidants. But they actually do not participate directly in human biochemistry and they don't act directly as antioxidants, meaning they don't scavenge free radicals. Oxidation and reduction are complex processes, oxidation being the loss of electrons, reduction being the gain of electrons. So for a compound to be an antioxidant, it really means it has to prevent free radicals from forming or quench free radicals. Free radicals are molecules with unpaired electrons. So if in order for a compound to be an antioxidant, it has to take a molecule with an unpaired electron and donate an electron to that molecule. In our bodies, we have endogenous antioxidants like glutathione that do this, but plant molecules don't do this. Plant molecules do the opposite. Plant molecules are pro-oxidants. So isothiocyanates like sulforaphane are pro-oxidants. And this is not something that's really debated. This is accepted, but they, by being pro-oxidants, uh, resveratrol can be a pro-oxidant as well. There are many compounds that can do this. By acting as pro-oxidants, they can induce our endogenous antioxidant response system, which is a series of genes that turns on enzymes that make more glutathione, superoxide dismutase, other enzymes that are participating in our endogenous antioxidant response. So it's very important to realize that plant molecules don't directly participate in human biochemistry. They can turn on antioxidant response elements in humans because they are pro-oxidants. And so this is widely accepted as the mechanism. So if you eat sulforaphane from broccoli or cabbage, that will increase your body's supply of glutathione. People say, isn't that good? Well, it can be good, but it's only good if we need it. And I think there's plenty of good evidence that we don't need plant molecules to achieve optimal antioxidant status. One of the things I talk about in my book is living a radical life, quote unquote. I'm a child of the 80s. I love the word radical. What we find with human studies is that we can 
activate our own antioxidant response system with exercise, sunlight, sauna, cold. All of these are environmental hormetics. And there's pretty good evidence that plant compounds don't give us more glutathione above and beyond just the way we should be living our normal life. There are plenty of studies with fruits and vegetables where these are taken away completely in the diet. So they compare a diet with no fruits and vegetables to a diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, and they don't see any differences in antioxidant response, oxidative stress, or DNA damage, suggesting that for a lot of us, uh, probably for most of us, if we're exercising, going in the sun, jumping in cold plunges, we have the ability to completely optimize our antioxidant response system without plant chemicals. So my impression is that hormesis from plant molecules has been wrongly, so the story is wrongly told to us that they somehow make us better than we are without them. And that wouldn't be such a big deal if it weren't for all the other side effects of these plant molecules. And this is what I think is widely being missed. When we go to the pharmacy to get a drug from the pharmacist, it comes with a package insert. And there are all these side effects, whether the drug is for blood pressure or a statin for cholesterol or whatever we're taking a, a, a pharmaceutical medication for, we know they have side effects. Well, plant molecules, plant phytoalexins, plant toxins, those are all synonyms, are just the same thing. They're just molecules from plants that are essentially plant pharmaceuticals. They can have some beneficial effects in the human body. Curcumin, for instance, probably does do some anti-inflammation stuff. But what we're not seeing, what's not being given to us, what's very rarely being shown to us in the research, or at least the research regarding this is not being talked about, and that's part of my uh, sort of uh, focus is to talk about the research with plant molecules and show people that there's lots of research on how they're potentially toxic for us that's not being shown to us. If we look at this, plant molecules have package inserts too. Plant molecules have side effects that we're not really being told about. My thinking is that this is probably due to supplement manufacturers feeling as though they are hoping to push sulforaphane or resveratrol or curcumin. In the book, I talk about studies with curcumin. There are specifically two or three papers that one might read if they were super geeky and wanted to get into this. One of them is called The Dark Side of Curcumin, and the title kind of says it all. There are many studies which show that curcumin can harm native human cells in addition to cancer cells that curcumin can affect our genetics, can affect the way genes are turned on and off negatively, affecting enzymes like topoisomerase 2 or 3, which uh, control the winding and unwinding of DNA, that curcumin can cause oxidative damage in our cells, that curcumin can break DNA, and that curcumin can activate uh, or turn off tumor suppressor genes like P53. So the point here is just to say, why would we use plant molecules if they don't really give us any benefit? In the case of curcumin, the case uh, that's sort of the, the suggestion I make in the book is, if we're using a molecule as an anti-inflammatory, don't we want to know where that inflammation is coming from in the first place? A lot of times I think we get suckered into ideas around using plant molecules because they're, quote, safer. And in fact, they're just molecules like any pharmaceutical. Uh, the doses may be lower or the doses can be higher. Sometimes plant molecules are much more toxic than the pharmaceuticals we might get from the pharmacy. So why would we use plant molecules to correct something like inflammation when that inflammation might actually be a signal to us that something is out of balance? We should correct the inflammation at its roots. We shouldn't go using plant molecules either to uh, increase our antioxidant status when we don't really need to do that. There's no good evidence that plant molecules make us any better from an antioxidant status. Or why would we use plant molecules as anti-inflammatories or to treat symptoms without actually getting to the root cause? Inflammation is not a curcumin deficiency. No one is born with a curcumin deficiency, just like no one is born with a deficiency of Lipitor, a statin medication, or any other medication. We're not born with those things. Imbalance comes from I believe a lot of uh, dis, uh, discordance between our genetics and our environment, specifically foods we eat that might trigger our immune system, leading to leaky gut and other problems. And so it's more about kind of returning to that ancestral principle or the original principle, what food is most compatible with our microbiome, what food is most compatible with our immune system. Those two pieces of it are critical. The microbiome is a whole other rabbit hole that shifts on its own, uh, independent of food. Well, when we eat different foods, it can shift on its own. But generally speaking, we're just thinking about the crosstalk between our microbiome and the immune system and which food is compatible with our immune system. And one of the suggestions that I make with the work that I do 
and thinking about more animal-based diets, they don't have to be entirely animal-based, is that a lot of plants can trigger our immune system because of these chemicals that we were talking about. So in regard to the plants discussion, without getting too deep into it, again, it's all detailed in my book, The Carnivore Code, is that plants make toxins because they've had to, and they pretty much do this invariably. They dissuade animals from eating them. And if we overconsume specific plants or if we eat plants that are incompatible with our own immune system, all those plant defense chemicals can be quite bad for us, trigger the immune system, potentially trigger autoimmune disease. Hormesis is quite a misleading concept. I don't think we need plant molecules to be optimal. I think there are many studies which suggest that. I don't think we need um, polyphenols to be optimal. Uh, polyphenols are also not antioxidants. They are pro-oxidants. And we can activate that NRF2 system and generate plenty of glutathione without them and avoid all of the potentially negative damaging side effects of these plant molecules, which are so rarely talked about. I talked about curcumin. I talked about resveratrol. Isothiocyanates like sulforaphane can also compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid. I have a, a strong suspicion that isothiocyanates in broccoli, kale, cabbage, cauliflower, collard greens, Brussels sprouts are contributing to a large amount of thyroid disease and imbalance today, and that we will be much better off removing them. I think that the brassica family, though well-loved, uh, is quite toxic for humans in general and uh, whatnot. Today's episode continues after this short message from one of my sponsors who make the show possible, plus give you some great deals on my favorite things. ButcherBox features 100% grass-fed and finished heritage-bred pork and organic free-range chicken. ButcherBox sends you high-quality, health-promoting meats directly to your door on dry ice and free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. ButcherBox makes committing to quality protein sources less expensive and more available to everyone. Their prices are hard to beat, and it's challenging to find a higher quality product anywhere in the USA. I've been using ButcherBox for years and love the convenience of a package showing up just when I need it, and their ground sausage is an absolute dream. ButcherBox has put together a super special deal for all listeners of the show. Order your first box and get a special gift plus an additional $20 off. Now, this special gift is so epic that I can't even mention it on the episode today. So you'll have to go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get your $20 off your very first order. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get $20 off your first order. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. So in the book, I present a plant toxicity spectrum, and I think which plants are most toxic and which plants are less toxic. And I think that it will probably come as no surprise that if you were a plant, you would not want an animal eating your stems, roots, leaves, or bark, or your seeds. But you might want an animal eating your fruit. So fruit is likely to be less toxic in terms of these phytoalexins. And fruit is probably a bigger category of plant food than we are used to thinking about. So in the book, I think of fruit and specifically non-sweet fruit, non-hybridized, non-overly sugar-created fruit, like we've done with so many fruits, made them bigger and sweeter than they actually were. Uh, whether or not that has an impact on us is questionable, but I think it probably does. So non-sweet fruits, I think, are probably the least toxic plant foods. These would include things like avocado, olives, squash, depending what we're thinking in terms of uh, where we want to be on a keto versus carbohydrate-based metabolism, things like squash could be great, or berries. These are kind of the non-sweet fruits. So I would think of those as the least toxic plant foods. Lettuce might be in there as well, like romaine or red or green leaf lettuce. But on the flip side of the toxicity spectrum, I think of the brassica vegetables. I think of this family as quite toxic because of the isothiocyanates, uh, this family of compounds that are a known phytoalexin of which sulforaphane is one that can really negatively affect the thyroid and it should be highly avoided. Other quite toxic plant families appear to be things like nightshades. We talked about that a little earlier. Tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant. Those seem to really trigger people's immune systems, probably because of specific lectins. Lectins are carbohydrate binding proteins. I talk about all this in the book. Uh, lectins can be pretty toxic and it appears that the nightshade family has lots of them. I also think of the seeds of plants as quite toxic because that's what plants don't want to get eaten at all. Those are plant babies and plants don't want us to eat seeds. So, and seeds actually includes grains, seeds, nuts, and legumes. 
This is kind of the autoimmune paleo perspective that all of those seeds, which we just divide into those categories, but they're all plant babies. They're all seeds, technically speaking, can be highly defended. They all have large amounts of phytic acid, oxalic acid, and digestive enzyme inhibitors in them that can really interrupt our digestion. So plant seeds can be quite triggering for people. And that may come as no surprise to many listeners of this podcast who, who try to avoid grains or beans, but I do think nuts and seeds are are similarly bad. And I think a lot of people, if they have digestive issues, will do very well to eliminate all nuts. They're very hard to digest for humans. Now, in the middle end, in the middle of the plant toxicity spectrum, I would think of sweet fruits and things like tubers. Some people will probably tolerate sweet potatoes okay. We talked about white potatoes as pretty darn toxic as nightshades for many people. Maybe people will tolerate sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes have a decent amount of oxalate, so we have to be careful with those. Uh, and sweet fruit, I'm just not sure it's a great thing for us to be over-consuming. That probably will come as no surprise to people on this podcast if it's the keto diet podcast. Some fruit occasionally is fine, but it's pretty clear that overconsumption of fruit can have negative impacts on our dental health. And I think that's always a good proxy or litmus for how it's going to affect our body in general. And I think that as many have shown, whether they're Weston Price or other dentists, that the mouth is really um, the gateway to human health. And if we don't have healthy teeth or gums, whatever food we're eating is probably not interacting with our bodies in a good way. So I think some sweet fruit can be doable, but I wouldn't overdo it on that. So what are the most toxic foods? We talked about them, nuts, seeds, grains, legumes, brassica vegetables, uh, nightshades. What's a little less toxic? Sweet fruit, tubers, less toxic in general, berries, non-sweet fruit, squash, avocado, olives, these kinds of things, lettuce, less toxic plant foods. So if we are thinking about eating some plant foods in our diet, we might think about that plant toxicity spectrum. Again, I detail all that in the book and uh, eliminate the most toxic foods first, which would be something like an autoimmune paleo diet. What's different about what I am suggesting here is that the, I think the leafy greens, specifically the brassicas and spinach can be very triggering for people, can be very offensive, and those might be on an autoimmune paleo diet. So in a way, I'm kind of like the anti-broccoli crusader. I'm kind of like anti-kale. I know it's well-loved. I hope nobody's offended, but I just don't think kale loves us back at all. I think it's, it's making a clear effort to harm us with isothiocyanates, this whole family of compounds derived from glucosinolates as phytoalexins. So that's kind of how I think about plants. And again, it's not that I believe everyone needs to eliminate all plants, just that they exist on a spectrum. And if we're not where we want to be, there may be plants in our diet that are not playing nice with our immune system. In the book, I talk more about fiber, uh, the lack of human need for fiber, the lack of evidence that fiber is beneficial for constipation, diverticulosis, cancer prevention. There's very good evidence that fiber really doesn't do any of those things for us. And there's very good evidence that in many people, the removal of fiber significantly improves gastrointestinal symptoms. So if you have gas, bloating, constipation, I talk about a study in the book where the complete removal of fiber resolved 100% of gas, bloating, and constipation in the experimental group relative to the high fiber group, which continued with all their GI symptoms. So I go into lots of detail about fiber in the book and the lack of human need for that. Uh, trust me, you can poop just fine without fiber. Many people do. There's no problem there. As long as you're getting enough fat and salt and uh, other things in your diet, uh, there should be no problem pooping without fiber. But fiber is a whole other rabbit hole that I won't go down too deeply now. Let's shift over to meat. Because I think that there's so much anti-meat rhetoric these days that is unfounded. And I definitely believe that sourcing is important. And I support farms like White Oak Pastures in Georgia and Belcampo in Northern California, both of which do regenerative agriculture. I'll probably close this podcast with a little bit about regenerative agriculture, but they do rotational grazing. They're grass-fed, grass-finished. They're carbon negative. Uh, on life cycle analysis, and they enrich the soil with organic matter, and they make good animals. So obviously, I'm a fan of good quality animal meat. But look, anyone who says that meat is bad for humans can only quote epidemiology studies. And it's really important to understand what epidemiology studies are. Epidemiology studies are not experiments. They are surveys. And they look at people over time, and they use recalls to say, what did you eat? And then how healthy are you? Now, this sounds like it might be reasonable at first, but if we think about it in more detail, we very quickly realize that there are so many factors that could be confounders here that make it so difficult to tease out what it is about someone's lifestyle that makes them healthy or diseased. 
This is the idea that correlation does not equal causation. In the book, I have some hilarious examples. There's all sorts of data points in our lives that are correlated that don't have, that are not causatively related. And so this is the problem with epidemiology. Because a group of people in the United States eats less meat and does better, or eats more meat and does worse, does not mean that meat is doing that. What we tend to find is something called healthy user bias. Because the narrative in this country has been that meat is bad for us for the last 70 years, um, since Ansel Keys and the Seven Countries study, generally when people don't eat meat, it's because they're, doing, they're thinking that they're doing the healthy thing. And they're doing other healthy behaviors. They're going in the sun, they're exercising, they're spending time with family. They're probably of higher socioeconomic status because they're making conscious what they think are health choices. And so all of those things can lead to improvements in health outcomes that are not connected with the absence of meat. Similarly, people who have eaten meat over the last 70 years are kind of the rebel types. They're, they're like the James Dean types in the book is what I call them. And they're more likely to not exercise, to not be in the sun, to smoke, to drink, and to ride motorcycles, to do other dangerous behaviors, because, and also to eat the meat with junk food. So that's the problem is you, we can't just give someone a survey and look at health outcomes and know what part of that survey or what part of their life is contributing to that. That is correlation, not causation. When we look at epidemiology studies further, we can find conflicting epidemiology studies. And so this is what's so dangerous about them. And we run into the problem of cherry picking. The idea that basically, unless we consider the entirety of the epidemiology studies, what we'll find is that you know you can choose three or four epidemiology studies that support your point and ignore three or four that contradict it. If we look at epidemiology studies of meat consumption in Asia, for instance, we find that the men who eat the most meat have the lowest rates of cardiovascular disease, and the women who eat the most re- ha- meat have the lowest rates of cancer. And that's probably because the narrative around meat is totally flipped in Asia. People who eat meat in Asia are felt to be rich. It's a sign of affluence. And so it makes total sense that people who eat more meat are more affluent. They're going to do better. Whereas in the States, we've been told the opposite. Meat is bad for you. So who eats meat? People that are rebels. And those people are not going to do other things well, and they're eating meat with meat. They're eating meat with bread or sugar, or soda, or fries at McDonald's. So we can't blame meat for what the bread and junk food that came with it may have done. And what we really need are interventional trials. Trials where we take a group of people, we increase the amount of meat in their diet, and then we look to see what their interventional markers show, inflammatory markers, et cetera. And those studies have been done, and invariably, they do not show that red meat is harmful. They actually show that it's beneficial. I talk about one study in the book where people replaced carbohydrates in the diet with eight ounces, half a pound of red meat per day. And at the end of the study, inflammatory markers went down. So that's interventional research as opposed to survey epidemiology. The survey epidemiology is so misleading because it's just recall and it's all correlation does not equal causation. So when someone says meat is bad for you and they're pointing to X, X, Y, Z study, like the Game Changers documentary saying eating meat is associated with a 300% increased rate of cardiovascular disease, that's epidemiology. That's cherry-picked epidemiology, and that's probably healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. The people who ate meat doing all the other unhealthy behaviors and then getting sick more. But was it the meat or was it the unhealthy behaviors? You test it with interventional studies. Interventional studies do not suggest that meat is harmful for humans. And why would it be? Humans have been eating meat for our, the entirety of our evolution. The first two chapters of my book are about human evolution, about the evidence that we have for what people have eaten in the past, both with stable isotope studies of bones of Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens uh, 50,000 years ago and further back, about 2 million years ago, we can look at tooth samples and there's evidence of hunting and there's evidence looking at the size of the human brain. About 2 million years ago, the human brain skyrocketed in size and we see the advent of stone tools, bifacial tools called Acheulean tools at that time, as well as evidence for hunting. There's very good evidence, both from stable isotope studies and the conglomeration of anthropologic archaeologic evidence that humans started hunting 2 million years ago and the human brain skyrocketed in size, likely due to the sudden availability of unique nutrients like vitamin B12, omega-3 fatty acids, more calories, minerals, uh, probably vitamin K, et cetera, that allow neuronal growth in the human brain. So why would meat be bad for us if it's been at the center of our evolution, if meat was probably the key spark that allowed us to grow into the resourceful humans that we are today? So it doesn't make sense from a uh, sort of a story perspective, from an evolutionary anthropology perspective, 
and it's not supported by the interventional research. One of the other great myths about meat is that it'll cause colon cancer. And again, this is based on epidemiology. And if we look, there's plenty of conflicting epidemiology that people will not tell you about when they say that. So there is an IARC report from 2015, which I detail in the book, the International Association for Research on Cancer, which is connected with the WHO, the World Health Organization. And they had over 800 studies to look at to make a consensus decision about connections between meat and cancer. They excluded all of those studies except 14 all of which were epidemiology. We don't know why they uh, excluded interventional studies and uh, studies that did not show, uh, that did not support their conclusions, but they only considered 14 studies. So when someone says red meat causes cancer and they say there's a WHO report that says it, it's a WHO report considering 14 epidemiology studies, eight of which did not show an association between meat and cancer, six of which did only one of those six showed a statistically significant association between red meat and cancer. So this gets into some statistical jargon, but the idea is that if there's a correlation in statistical analysis and epidemiology, but it's not statistically significant, it's very likely due to error in the data. We only pay attention when there's statistically significant differences between groups or correlations. Again, correlation is not causation, but of one out of the 14 studies in the IARC report, showed that red meat was significantly correlated with cancer, and 13 did not. Again, eight showed no, no correlation, five showed a correlation that was not statistically significant, and one showed one that was statistically significant. In the one study that showed statistically significant correlation between red meat and cancer was done in Loma Linda, which is a Seventh-day Adventist community, where people are generally told that red meat diets are bad for them. And the majority of the population is plant-based or virtually plant-based, a lot of lacto-ovo vegetarians there. So who eats meat in Loma Linda? People who are pretty rebellious. And people that also, if you look at the data, tend to be more obese and more insulin resistant. What do we know about obesity and insulin resistance? They are very tightly correlated with cancer. So isn't it possible that even in that one study out of 14, the association between red meat and cancer could be other unhealthy behaviors done by those people and or the obesity that we see in those people and the associated insulin resistance. And that is what is in fact connected with cancer. But narratives around red meat being bad for us, red meat and cancer are invariably based on epidemiology, which is so, so misleading. I'll just make one more point about that and then move on to not belabor this and not to let this podcast go too long because I want to talk about regenerative agriculture as well. So um, there's a study in Britain called the UK Shopper Study, fascinating study. And what they did was they looked at the death rates of vegans and they compared it to the general uh, population. It might have been vegetarians in these people. I don't know if they were eating any animal products. It was either vegans or vegetarians. They compared the death rate in that group of population to the general British population. And they found that vegetarians had lower death rates. But then they took a subset of the population in Britain who did other, quote, healthy behaviors. And the death rates were equivalent between omnivorous meat-eating Britons who did healthy behaviors and vegetarians. And this is to illustrate the point that it's not the avoidance of meat in the vegetarians that is likely leading to improved death rates. It's the other healthy behaviors because we see equivalent longevity in Britons and groups throughout the world who do healthy things but continue to eat meat. A great example of this is the Loma Linda uh, folks, people talk about blue zones. I'm probably not going to go into blue zones in this podcast. I've talked about it repeatedly. Um, I released a podcast on my podcast, Fundamental Health with Terry Walls, where we really dug into blue zones. And I talked about how inaccurate this notion is. But Loma Linda, California is thought to be a quote, blue zone. People say, oh, that the, um, the people in Loma Linda live seven years longer than the average Californian. But what is neglected to be discussed is that Mormons in California who are also living seven years longer than the general Californian population. In Loma Linda, people shun meat. Mormons do not shun meat. So it's much more likely that, it, that the increased uh, lifespan in Loma Linda has nothing to do with the um, avoidance of meat and everything to do with the other healthy behaviors that are common in uh, religious communities, avoidance of drinking, Generally, uh, smoking is shunned, focus on family and community. And that's what we see across all the blue zones as commonalities 
is good lifestyle behaviors rather than the plant-based aspect of those diets or the avoidance of meat being beneficial because there are plenty of places in the world. And again, I detail all this in the book and I really kind of debunk the notion of blue zones. There are so many places in the world where people live long lives like Hong Kong and they eat lots of meat. So again, this gets into the concept of cherry picking. You can find five places in the world like Dan Buettner did that may fit your theory, but those are not the only places in the world where people live longer than average. And uh, if you actually look into what people are eating in those different blue zones places, they, they do eat significant amounts of meat. So they're not vegetarian, they're not vegan, and they're not even really plant-based. Uh, that's widely a misconception regarding the, the most of those places. And we talked about Loma Linda and how they actually don't have any significant survival benefit relative to other people who don't, uh, who do healthy behaviors and shun damaging things like coffee, uh, well, uh, maybe coffee, but, uh, tobacco and alcohol. So that that's a quite interesting rabbit hole to go down with regard to that. I will also add that when we look at sperm quality in Loma Linden's, uh, those who are vegan and vegetarian have much worse sperm quality, both in terms of sperm numbers and motility. And so all these studies are cited in my book, but it's very clear that in Loma Linda, if you eat less meat and more plants, you have uh, reduced fertility in males, which is probably not suggesting a good thing. So that's not, I can't even, I don't know why anyone considers it a blue zone. That seems a myopic characterization of that part of the world to me. I hope you're really enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. Snap a pic and tag me at Healthful Pursuit or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. With regard to meat, I make an effort in the book to discuss the unique nutrients in meat that are not found in plants that are vital for human health, that are vital for maternal health, that are vital for healthy babies and healthy pregnancies. These include things like choline, which makes membranes and neurotransmitters, carnitine, uh, creatine is for our muscles and our brains, carnosine, taurine, vitamin B12, everyone is familiar with. We talked about that in the context of evolution and the fact that increasing access to B12 in animal foods probably led to brain growth in humans, which was widely accelerated. Uh, vitamin K2 is a special form of vitamin K that has been associated with decreased cardiovascular disease incidence and really only occurs significantly in animal foods. You can eat natto, which is fermented soybeans and get vitamin K2, but there are not many other sources of vitamin K2. And I would advise against eating fermented soybeans because of all of the xenoestrogens, well, I should say phytoestrogens in soybeans. And I talk about all of that in the book as well. Soybeans are pretty well known to stimulate 17 beta estradiol uh, receptors as well and be hormonal disruptors. So uh, vitamin K2, crucial to get for cardiac health, adequate or essential proper calcium partitioning, and only really available in animal foods. So I talk about that. I talk about the bioavailability of nutrients in animal foods. I really believe animal foods are the true superfoods for humans. That's sort of the first premise I talked about uh, at the beginning of this podcast. And then I debunk myths around the microbiome, uh, the need for fiber in the microbiome, the need for fiber in constipation, the need for fiber in cancer. All those are real myths. And when we really dig into it, we don't need fiber for any of those things. If you want to get some fiber and you tolerate it, that's great. But if you have problems that with your GI system, gas bloating, constipation, diarrhea, a lot of times removal of fiber is very helpful for people, especially the plant fiber. And then I debunk the notions of red meat and cancer. We talked a little bit about that with the IARC study and the WHO. And then I go into the whole notion of red meat, cardiovascular disease, LDL. There's a whole chapter on that. I probably will not go too deep on that in this podcast, but the take home is that uh, what causes cardiovascular disease, what causes heart attacks is insulin resistance. And we cannot interpret LDL in a vacuum. Uh, though LDL may rise on a ketogenic diet, this is probably due to a shared biochemical pathway for acetyl-CoA, which is the precursor for ketones, but also the precursor for uh, HMG-CoA, uh, which is the mevalonate pathway, which makes cholesterol as well. That is to say that when we make ketones, the ketone synthesis pathway and the cholesterol synthesis, synthesis pathway are shared. And if we have ketones, we know that cholesterol will go up, our LDL will go up, but that is probably not a bad thing. It's probably a very good thing 
and it doesn't lead to heart disease unless we are insulin resistant. How do we stay insulin sensitive? Hmm. This is a super important question, especially when we're talking about hormones. I think one of the biggest things that many women listening to this may be aware of is that things like PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, anovulation, irregular cycles, basically uh, infertility are often due to insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is not necessarily a product of carbohydrates, but rather a product, I think, of processed foods, hydroxylated or oxidized vegetable oils, and um, overeating on processed food, processed carbohydrates uh, together. And so um, ketogenic diets, low-carb diets can be very helpful for improving insulin sensitivity because they remove a macronutrient, specifically carbohydrates, which when combined with fat in any form that's in any way processed can cause us to overeat it. So, you know, I think that low-carb diets can be fantastic um, in improving insulin sensitivity. Carnivore diet can be fantastic for improving insulin sensitivity. I don't think we need to cut out carbs all the time. If we're going to include carbohydrates, I would consider the plant toxicity spectrum and use them uh, in the right way, depending on weight loss goals and whatnot. But uh, insulin resistance uh, can be caused by inflammation as well. So if our gut is inflamed or triggered from plant toxins, or we have leaky gut or a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that can worsen insulin resistance. But generally, insulin resistance develops uh, in people who are really overeating uh, carbohydrates and fat together. That is a satiety um, abolishing combination, uh, things like ice cream or cookies or cakes, processed foods. And in some people, it appears there's less of a tolerance to even non-processed carbohydrates, and that's an individual thing. I think that's why low-carb diets works for many people. But moderate carbohydrate diets can be great for other people, depending on the context. I think it's the quality of the carbohydrates that we suggest, the context that we, that we choose. It's the quality of the carbohydrates that we choose and the, um, the context of the diet and everything else that's in it. So with regard to insulin resistance, we can check blood work, like fasting insulin is probably the best way. And when we are back to LDL, we have to think about the triglyceride to HDL ratio. That is the most important piece of the context when looking at LDL, because if we are insulin sensitive with um, a healthy body composition, not much inflammation or low inflammation, a good triglyceride to HDL ratio, low fasting blood sugars, low hemoglobin A1C, and low levels of um, fasting insulin, a higher LDL on a ketogenic or low-carb diet is probably nothing to worry about. So we talk about all of that in the book. And then at the end of the book, I will talk about uh, how to eat a carnivore diet. I lay it out. I'm a big fan of organ meats. I think we should be getting, eating animals nose to tail. I think that's crucially important for humans to get all the nutrients we need. Uh, it's all laid out for you in the book. The plant toxicity spectrum is in the book. And then I close the book with some common fit pitfalls. And then I talk about regenerative agriculture. And I just want to spend a few minutes talking about this before I wrap up. It is something that is near and dear to my heart. I think that the persistence of humans on this planet depends on the amount of organic matter in the soil. And what we know is that ruminants grazing on the land properly, moving around like buffalo, like millions of buffalo, elk, antelope, pronghorn have been doing for thousands and thousands of years, puts carbon back into the soil uh, because the soil is enriched in organic matter. When animals poop on the soil and turn the soil, they put nutrients back into the soil. Anyone who's gardened or done compost knows that animal manure is needed to re-enrich the soil. We need that nitrogenous component from animals to uh, enrich the soil. And what we've run into now with our current food chain is a monocrop system that involves way too much tilling and that has having to use synthetic fertilizers, which do not enrich the organic matter in the soil. We can try and put back in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to grow things year after year doing monocrop agriculture, but unless we can put organic matter back into the soil with properly grazed, properly a rotated animal grazing that mimics ecosystems, that mimics grassland foraging of things like buffalo and elk and antelope, we are going to be in big trouble if we can't do that. That's what's so cool about regenerative agriculture. These are farms like White Oak and Belcampo and many others. Joel Salatin has Polyface Farm on the East Coast, and there are some in Canada. There are many throughout the U.S. doing this. We can rotate the cows among pastures, and they eat the grass down to 
a low level without killing the grass. They move on and eat somewhere else and the grass regrows and the grass gets to be very rich because the cows have been peeing and pooping there and the grass has the beautiful fertilizer. Then the cows come back and eat the grass again and the cycle continues. They move around and in the process, the soil becomes teeming with life, which is what we need. What's fascinating is that when the organic matter in the soil increases, the soil will pull more carbon dioxide. Plants use carbon dioxide. Plants inhale carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They fix it into their roots, and that makes uh, carbohydrates that animals can eat. Um, specifically, you know, the ruminants can digest grass and the carbohydrates that are from the air. So what happens in the methane cycle? People get worried about methane. But as we're seeing, if we look at a life cycle analysis of cows or ruminants, when they're raised properly, they are resulting in more carbon being sequestered into the earth than they are producing with their burps. But people get worried about cow burps, but they participate in a cycle called the carbon cycle, whereby the methane goes into the atmosphere, it's fixed into carbon dioxide, uh, it's oxidized to carbon dioxide, and then fixed into the plant's in their root system and in the carbohydrates and their leaves, which are sometimes eaten by animals. And then that same carbon atom is released in a cycle. So people get all worried about ruminants and belching methane, but that methane has always been on the planet. It's always been here. There's always been millions of ruminant animals. The real problem in terms of greenhouse gases is new emissions, the liberation of new carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. And anyone who points to cows in connection with climate change is really not thinking about this in the proper way. Uh, unfortunately, there are many statistics that are widely misquoted, but um, in the book I offer some statistics regarding greenhouse gas emissions estimated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States in 2016. And if you look at the amount of methane emissions coming out of cows, it is 2.8, or excuse me, 1.8% of annual greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation, 30%. Electricity generation, 26%. So methane coming out of cows pales in comparison to the amount of carbon dioxide that is liberated via transportation. This gets confusing when people cite FAO data, which is a different source of data, saying that global livestock contribute as much to greenhouse gases as transportation. The problem with this FAO data, if you really dig into it, is that they are looking at a life cycle analysis of ruminants and they're comparing it to what comes out of the tailpipe of automobiles. And you can't do that because the tailpipe of an automobile is equivalent to like a cow burp. But a life cycle of a cow is looking at all the carbon inputs uh, that, that it took to like move the cow around, what it took to process the cow, what it took to, ca the, the, to move the cow's uh, meat to markets. Whereas when they're comparing tailpipe emissions, that's not a life cycle emission of the cars. If we do life cycle emissions on cars, we see much greater carbon burdens than anyone is talking about. And unfortunately, the FAO never did a life cycle analysis of transportation or greenhouse gas emissions from tailpipes from cars. They only did tailpipe emissions. So if you compare tailpipe to quote tailpipe, that's what the EPA data did. They looked at emissions from cows to emissions from the tailpipe of automobiles. The FAO data is comparing tailpipe of an of a automobile to a life cycle of a cow. That's apples to oranges. If you compare tailpipe of a ca car to uh, emissions of cattle, cattle don't produce anywhere near as much uh, greenhouse gas emissions as transportation globally, but that doesn't make sensational headlines and that doesn't pin the blame on cows. So if people are concerned about the environment, I would encourage them to explore regenerative agriculture. I would encourage them to really look into where these numbers are coming from and how misleading the FAO data can be if we don't know what we're looking at and compare it to the EPA data and really understand that methane from cows is part of a carbon cycle. It's always been part of this earth and that is not the problem. If we eliminate ruminant animals, ecosystems will collapse. The last thing I will add is that the biggest methane producer is termites. So there are lots of natural inputs to methane that we should not get rid of. Methane is a gas that comes from the earth. There are natural wetlands that produce methane. Unfortunately, landfills produce methane. Cows are not the problem here. Cows are good food for humans that is very rich, very nutritious, can be raised properly with regenerative agriculture and actually sequester more carbon than they, than they produce and enrich the soil, which allows us to continue to farm it for future generations. If we continue with monocrop agriculture, our ecosystem will collapse because we won't be able to farm for much longer. We can't keep doing that. Plant-based advocates who 
want to eliminate ruminants are uh, unfortunately very short-sighted because monocrop agriculture is incredibly unsustainable and ruminant agriculture is the answer. It's the only sustainable way to do this if we do it regeneratively and increase the organic matter in the soil. So that is super fascinating. Hopefully that's new, not too esoteric. I know I talk fast. I talked a lot today, you guys. I talked about all kinds of stuff. I know you guys will probably have questions. I hope some of that is helpful for people. Again, my book is The Carnivore Code. I go into all of this. I do not think everyone needs to cut out all the plants in their diet. I do think that animals are incredibly nutritious and should be a healthy part of a baby's diet, a child's diet, an adult's diet, a man's diet, a woman's diet, that we should support regenerative agriculture and well-raised cattle. And I think plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity, and that should not be underestimated if we are not kicking all the butt that we want to kick, whether on any diet with the reading and often eliminating the most toxic plants or eliminating all plants for some time or a long time is a fantastic idea. Again, like I said in the beginning, I am a conventionally trained doctor. Um, so this is quite contrary to much of the mainstream thought, but I have been doing this for a year and over a year and a half and looked at all my labs and feel great. I've realized I don't need fiber to poop. Uh, I don't need fiber to perform in the gym. I don't need carbs to perform in the gym and I don't need plant toxins in my life. So I hope you guys will find this helpful. And the intention is again, just to provide help for people who are not finding answers. And I would encourage you to look at people who are thriving on a carnivore diet. I think Leanne probably mentioned a lot of my socials, but I'll let you guys know where to find me if you wanna learn more about my stuff. Again, thecarnivorecodebook.com. My book drops February 25th on Amazon. Thank you for your support. Check it out. There's ebook, audio book, and print copy. And my website is carnivoremd.com. You can sign up for my newsletter there. I have all of my podcasts indexed there. My podcast is called Fundamental Health. And I talk to all kinds of cool people on the podcast. And on Instagram and Twitter, I am at carnivoremd. I have a YouTube channel as well under my name, Paul Saladino. And that is it, you guys. Um, if you listen to any of my stuff, you will know that my slogan is stay radical. I appreciate you guys listening to this. I hope it's been valuable. I hope you will all stay radical. I hope you will all keep thriving and I wish you all, all of the health and blessings. And, um, yeah, I hope some of this is helpful. Let me know if it was. And if you have questions, please reach out to me on one of those outlets. And if you want to learn more, check out all my work, other places. So thank you guys. Stay radical. What a great episode, right? I just loved listening to this one, and I hope you did too. Next up on the show, Sunday, March 8th, episode 238, I have a solo episode where I talked about how I stopped eating so many carbs all those years ago. I'm so happy I made notes on all of these things because I, it's been so long I don't remember. But if you are new to keto or you're just struggling to get to that carb amount that you know that you feel best at, I've provided some tools and tips to help you get there. And then on Sunday, March 15th, episode 239, my friend Lysia is taking over the show to chat about how to eat keto with a family. She provides some really great tips and things I haven't even thought about because I don't have kids. I don't get how it all works. So Alicia provided some really, really great feedback on there. So I can't wait to share that with you. I hope you have a great day and we'll chat soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor should it be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 